All right, it is that time, so we will get started. Um, before I dive into today's lecture, are there any questions on what we talked about last time or anything like that? Let's go ahead and send any questions you have to the chat and we'll deal with them as they come. Cool, all right then. Um, so our goals today are to introduce the process of the processes of domain and application engineering, which is really a way of thinking about the development of systems like product lines, which are based on um, either generating assets for reuse or making use of those reusable assets from your own code or from other projects. And it's a way of thinking about developing for platforms and then taking aspects of those platforms to generate your concrete specific applications, uh, making use again of these reused assets uh, in a cost-effective and reasonable way. And we'll talk about some of the principles of engineering of software product lines uh, based on dealing with your business architectural process and organization related concerns. So as a bit of a reminder, uh, software product lines are highly configurable families of systems. They're built around common uh, modularized independent features. So together software product lines, uh, what they do is they address the needs of a particular market segment or fill some kind of niche and they're developed from a common set of core assets in a controlled and planned manner. Um, so if you develop systems in this way, you build these reusable assets and then connect those assets together to form a concrete product or one or more concrete products. Um, companies can produce this huge set of products more economically, and these are lean, um, highly focused products targeted at specific groups of users or specific clients, specific uh, usage scenarios. Um, and this can be done cost effectively in this way because your development effort put into the shared assets doesn't need to be duplicated. You, you build these pieces of code, um, microservices, classes or collection of classes once, and then you, you insert them in at the concrete point in your product. Um, software product lines also help companies better address product customization tasks to meet these specific needs of individual customers. And this allows you to sustain a high rate of product innovation, but keeping a relatively guaranteed levels of overall performance and quality. Uh, product lines are seen in a lot of different domains uh, and they're highly challenging to develop because they have technical process organization and business related aspects. Um, so we gave a few examples last time and they're used in a lot of companies from Volvo to Ericsson, Boeing um, in Android itself in the Linux operating system, right? But in all these cases, these, the, they build a, a core set of assets and then use those assets to generate lean targeted products uh, for particular users who have particular needs, right? So let's talk about how we would start to think about building one of these systems. Uh, four principles are used to govern successful product line engineering. And these are variability management, which is the idea that your individual systems that you build are considered as variations of a common theme. And so that variability, what differs between concrete products in your product line has to be made explicit. It has to be systematically managed. Product lines are business centric. Uh, they aim at thoroughly connecting the engineering of the product line with the long-term strategy of your business. What kind of markets do you want to serve and what kind of customers do you want to serve? Uh, what sort of features does it make sense to develop and what kind of options does it make sense to develop to eventually be deployed into these concrete products? Product line engineering, when successful, is architecture centric. Uh, the, the technical side of the software has to be developed in a way that allows taking advantages of the similarities between concrete systems in, in an efficient manner. And it tends to follow, um, product line development tends to follow a two life cycle approach, right? The individual systems are developed based on a software platform of reusable assets. Those products as well as the platform itself have to be engineered in the platform and then the concrete products have their own life cycles. And I'm sure you've talked about life cycle before of, of um, requirements, design, implementation, testing, deployment and maintenance. 
right? Those same kind of ideas almost happen twice here, where first you develop your platform and your reasonable assets. And then for each application, you have a mini life cycle centered around creating an application using those reusable assets. Right. Basically, development for reuse comes before the development making use of or with reuse. So software product line engineering aims at supporting a, a range of products customized to different individual customers and, and different usage types. As a result, variability is an important concept. Instead of understanding every individual system that you're building by itself, product line engineering looks at the product line as a whole the whole collection of systems you're building and what varies between those individual systems. That variability, those differences between the concrete products has to be defined, represented, exploited, implemented, evolved, and et cetera, and so forth, and managed together through, throughout product line engineering. So when you're managing variability in the product line, we need to distinguish three main types. Um, there's commonalities, which are characteristics as are either functional, as in the behavior of the software, or non-functional performance, security, speed, throughput, et cetera. Uh, those characteristics, whether functional or non-functional, can be common to all products in the product line, in which case we call the commonality. Those can be requirements shared between all of the concrete systems you build in your line, code, any asset that is going to be shared across the entire product line is a commonality. This is implemented as part of your platform and then reused in every single individual product that you build. Variabilities are characteristics or assets, code requirements, et cetera, that may be common to a subset of your products, but are not universal across the line. Uh, in that case, these variabilities, these characteristics only need to be explicitly modeled as a possible variability and implemented in a way that allows having it in the selected products only. And you can then leave it out of the products that don't need that particular code asset or characteristic. Finally, you have product specific characteristics. These are characteristics that are part of one product only and are not going to be reused, are not going to appear in multiple products. They're just going to be in this one product and you're done at least for the foreseeable future. And while these are, are not part of your platform, the platform itself has to at least not contradict them, uh, not conflict them in some way. The platform has to support the fact that you are going to have this feature in one particular product. So during the life cycle of the product line, um, a specific variability can change in type. Something that starts as common across the line, a commonality, may end up only being in some products later on and you eventually develop products without them. So it becomes a variability, right? Or the other direction, a product specific asset, you might later decide that you want to actually reuse in multiple products, in which case you're going to elevate it and refactor it into your product line, right? You know, maybe this is um, a piece of code, a, a function that we decide later we're going to reuse in which case we're going to have to, to pull it out and not treat it as code that only exists in that product, but it's something that's going to live in our product line and evolve with all of our other assets. The commonalities and variabilities, these are the things that are explicitly part of our platform, are things that we handle when we're focused on the process of domain engineering, on building the platform itself and maintaining the platform itself, right? Whereas product specific, uh, product specific characteristics or things we hold until we're developing a concrete product and worry about then. Right. So variability management, reasoning about variability is something that covers the entire product life cycle. This starts in the early stages of scoping in your requirements, uh, going all the way into our implementation and testing, and then finally going into um, maintenance and evolution of the product. So variability is something that's relevant to all assets we're building throughout development of a product line. And variability is something that we're going to return to and discuss often, that's, that's really the cornerstone of these product lines. That's why we develop them in this way, is to be able to develop reusable code and make use of that reused code uh, in, in a way that allows these systems to live separately, but easily make use of the assets that we build once, edit once, maintain once. Um, and that, that means there's some terms to introduce that we can use to reason about variability. 
Uh, the first of these is what's called the variation point. A variation point describes any point in our system where differences are going to exist between concrete products, right? Where one concrete product may differ from another with respect to the operating system it relies on, with respect to whether it supports a particular feature or not, uh, which algorithm a feature used, like how you, you know, how you sort a list might differ between concrete products. These are any point where, um, where we have two concrete systems in our product line and they might differ from each other in some way. So for example, we might have a security alarm uh, and we have a product line that supports different kinds of security alarms. And those security alarms might perform different kinds of detection, right? Uh, so which are gonna be supported by one concrete model of our alarm? Well, maybe some support cameras while others rely on motion detection. Uh, and maybe we have some who support both. Well, this is the point where we make a choice. It's a point where we can distinguish between different uh, concrete instantiations of our product line. Uh, and we make a choice between the different possibilities that exist to satisfy this variation point. And we call these possibilities features or variants. Right, so the features are what options we choose at each of these points. You know, for instance, in our, in our camera line, we can choose between camera surveillance or motion detection for the security alarm. We also need to discuss the dependencies introduced by a variation point. So not all feature selections are valid and specific meaningful final products. And two types of dependencies are used to decide what is a, what is a legal selection. First are variability dependencies, and these are how we denote the different choices, the different features that are possible to fill a variation point, right? This generally refers to the number of features that can be selected at the same time. If we have three options, can we choose all three at once or do we only choose one of those three? For instance, a, a program might support um, email or SMS message uh, or uh, you know, what's that message for delivering a notification and how many of those do we concurrently support or allow in our concrete product? We also are going to note which features are mandatory and which ones are optional add-ons. Uh, so in that last slide, we had that security alarm and you might require that all models have a camera while making the motion detection feature optional. You know, sometimes we'll include motion detection, maybe not, but we always have a camera. So feature dependencies describe different than dependencies between feature selections, where the selection of one feature may require in another variation point the selection of a particular feature afterwards. Right? Somewhere in this concrete system, choosing one feature as a, at a variation point is going to impose a constraint on another feature selection that we choose. Uh, we talked about that security alarm a couple of times. Well, may, we, we have different concrete products that have a different selection of detection features, and one is a camera, another has a camera and the motion detector, and another has a motion detector and a microphone. Well, uh, maybe we can't get one that has a microphone and a camera. So if we choose a camera, we can't choose microphone, right? That's an invalid selection. So feature dependencies are modeled explicitly in product lines as part of, of a process called feature modeling which is something that we're going to discuss more uh, next class and in the class after that as well. So features are the concerns of primary interest in product line engineering. Everything is centered around the development of features. Features are these assets that we build once and live in our platform that we then reuse in concrete products. A feature is an end user visible. That's the key part here, end user visible characteristic or behavior of the system. Often this is functionality a user will directly interact with. Features are used in product line engineering to specify and to reason about the commonalities and the variabilities. The, the uh, characteristics that are universal across the line and those that are only used in the subset of products. The differences of all the products between stakeholders and designers and features guide our structure. They guide how we reuse code. They guide variation across all phases of the development lifecycle. Uh, the product portfolio of a product line is defined by its features and how they relate to each other. So a specific product is identified by a subset of features called a feature selection. A product of the product line then is a concrete pro a piece of software that's specified 
by a valid feature selection, a subset of the features of the product line. And a feature selection is valid if and only if it fulfills all of our feature dependencies, right? So when we create a concrete product, we make a series of choices. For each variation point, we choose one or more features that are legal for that point and that are legal with the other choices we've made along the way. And this in the end gives us a product that includes a subset of these assets, right? That are targeted toward this particular market segment or, or usage scenario. So setting up the product line infrastructure is not the goal in itself. The ultimate aim is to make use of this portfolio of assets, this platform during the application engineering process. Uh, this is the instantiation of the variability. So as new requirements are captured, um, as we develop a concrete product to, during this application engineering process, every requirement has to be considered and a decision needs to be made about its future. Should it be, become part of the platform instead and be something that we use in a subset of products in the future, or is it something that's going to live as part of this one single concrete application? The simplest case is when the product line infrastructure already supports that requirement, right? So if our, our portfolio, our, our platform, it already supports this requirement, maybe this new feature can become a variant chosen in an existing variation point and plugged in at runtime. In that case, we just need to incorporate it appropriately uh, as a reusable asset. So it can be bound at, at compile time or runtime whenever we integrate features into the concrete product. If the requirement is not supported by your platform and your product line infrastructure, maybe it's an entirely new feature. Um, then there are three different possibilities for how you proceed. The first is that we could, you know, maybe just forget about it, drop it or replace it. And that might sound strange from the customer satisfaction perspective, but it's something that needs to be decided. The more variability we support, the more difficult the evolution of the, in the infrastructure becomes. Second possibility is that this new requirement should be integrated into our product line infrastructure. Maybe adding a new, um, a new variation point where we can choose between options to be expanded on in the future. Or third, this is something that's truly application specific, truly only in this one concrete instance of the application. Uh, and not to be part of any future instantiations of the product line right, in which case we're only going to focus on it when we build this one concrete product. Um, in the second case, where it's something that we're going to bring into our product line and become a new feature, a new variation point, then we step into this role, back into this role of domain engineering, implementing this as part of our overall asset portfolio and our overall product line infrastructure. In the third case, we remain in the concrete application engineering role, developing as part of this particular product. But typically all three cases occur when you develop the requirements uh, for system development. Now, while traditional software development focuses on an individual system, product line engineering needs to focus on the market as a whole. And because of the long-term investments, the long-term planning needed to create this asset platform, product line engineering can only be successful if the product line infrastructure in the long-term is a reasonable instrument to bring new products into the market efficiently. So as a consequence, development decisions for individual products are always linked back to the product line as a whole. And, and because of that strong linkage, it's important that the major business goals for your product line in it, uh, the engineering process are well understood. Why are you doing this? Your typical business goals are, are effort reduction or cost reduction and time to market reduction. You um, also might have quality goals, right? It's some sort of improvement in reliability or usability. Um, but all of these are important to think about you know, and be keep in mind as you go. Is developing all these reusable assets, is this something that actually is saving you effort and time? Is this something that's going to result in greater profit? Um, otherwise, is this something you really need to do? Right, so the specific set of goals that provide the basis of product line engineering effort, that's going to influence the decisions about when a requirement should be implemented. Is this something that you are going to develop as a reusable asset or you're going to develop as part of a concrete application? And whether it should even be implemented for the product line as a whole or only in one of these specific products. As a rule of thumb, there's a, a break even point from a cost perspective. 
It's about three concrete instantiations of a system. So is this a feature that you're going to eventually deploy in three or more products? If so, then maybe it should be developed as part of this product line. Uh, if not, if it's maybe once or twice, then this is something that you don't necessarily have to develop with an eye for reuse later on, right? But if there's three or more concrete realizations of a requirement, then this is usually something that's usually more cost effective to implement once as part of domain engineering as part of your product line platform. Right. So a business-centric approach to product line engineering means that decisions that you make about which functionality to include in your product line um, or versus a, in a concrete product is based on an economic decision. Uh, this is what we call scoping, and there's three main scoping steps we perform. Together, these determine whether we will develop a product line and then what is going to become part of that platform. Uh, so first, product portfolio planning aims at determining the specific products and the functionalities that are going to be supported by your infrastructure. So from the start, you want to do a bit of planning. What kind of products are you going to build? What are the differences between those products? Uh, do those need to be different products or can you offer a smaller set of concrete products to the customer? So here we're aiming at capturing the products that will eventually be part of our product line and identifying their main requirements. At this stage, we first come up with an overview of these commonalities and variabilities. What is universal and what differs between concrete products of the products we plan to build. This is the first stage where you can start to make optimizations. Um, this is something that's mostly performed from a marketing point of view and less from the engineering side. But the technical aspects are going to come into account as those are going to strongly impact your production costs and what kind of effort reductions you're going to see. So this is an overall picture. What products are we going to build and how do they differ from each other? From there, we look into domain potential analysis. And this is where we start to analyze the potential of our product line domain um, or the specific subdomains. Uh, and we're trying to identify whether there is a promising case for product line engineering. So here we're focusing on a systematic analysis of an area of functionality to determine whether it's worth investing in the whole product line. Hmm. Excuse me. Um, while other approaches are going to focus on individual areas within the product line. And the key issue at this stage is always to get some kind of systematic answer uh, to the question of where your reuse investment should be focused. What kind of areas are we going to focus on developing these clean, independent, reusable assets um, for, to use across the entire product line? Right, and then uh, what can be left to the individual products? Right, so finally then asset scoping aims at defining the individual components that should be built for reuse. Uh, so to adequately define those components, there's two viewpoints that you're going to bring together. Uh, these are the viewpoints of the business and the architecture, right? The, the business side of things and the technical side of things. And the business centric viewpoint is from an economics analysis. Um, while the architectural viewpoint looks at this from a technical angle, it makes sense implementation wise, right? But together you're working on making these decisions as to whether you're actually going to see cost savings from developing reusable assets. And, and so from that point, uh, it's, it's fairly difficult to develop something for reuse, more difficult than to just develop it and shove it into one single product. Right. And so you have to carefully decide how much of this you're going to design for reuse um, and what's going to make sense in terms of, of the, the time to market and benefits you get back from it. Right. So software product line engineering relies on a common architecture, right, with an architecture that supports variation, that supports plugging in these reusable assets. This is something called the reference architecture, right? So a shared design between the concrete products where they may differ in their functionality, but it's essentially a matter of plugging in different components, either when you compile the system or when you're running the system based on what's need for that, that needed for that concrete product. So the central role of this common architecture 
is um, a major part of the success of product line engineering compared to other approaches based on reuse. The reference architecture is something you design during the domain engineering process, right? When you lay out what's going to vary between these different products, you're also going to design a way to create products easily and then to easily create new concrete products later on by plugging in reusable assets at the right points and then around that constructing the glue that holds those reusable assets together as well as any additional product specific features right um, so this reference architecture is something you develop during domain engineering to provide a coherent picture of the different components that have to be um, developed and to make sure they all follow a compatible generic interface so that we can plug in different assets at those variation points that can be used throughout your different products. And that way the variants can be swapped at these variation points. You can swap between different features because they follow the same interface. So a common architecture defines a single environment for all components that are used in the individual products. And that ensures there's no need to develop uh, multiple components that address similar functionalities and that differ only res respect to the particular environment they work in. So in each application engineering cycle, every time we create a new concrete product, the reference architecture gives us the basis to derive that specific product's architecture, right? We start with the reference architecture, which defines how we glue things together. And then we bring in the assets and we bring in anything new that has to go into that concrete product. Uh, the product architecture is, is mainly derived through instantiation of these reusable generic assets. And the architectural decomposition of this provides the basis for then going out and assigning uh, work in your development process and determining how you modify assets to support the product specific requirements, right? We have these reusable assets. Uh, we may need to tune them and adapt them a little bit to a specific purpose. And so we're going to need to be able to support that within our system. So reference architectures are the key for the overall success of product line engineering. They make it easy to support and easy to control variability and give you clear means to control the complexity of the product. And then I'll say right now, this is all a very high level overview, right? But eventually we are, um, you know, eventually we're going to go into these topics in more detail. So the key difference between uh, traditional single system development and product line engineering is the shift in focus to this two life cycle model of domain and application engineering, right? From building one concrete product to being able to support a line of different, slightly different products that reuse particular assets between them. And that shift especially implies a shift in your strategy. It relies on a distinction of development for reuse, of preparing code with the intention of using it in multiple circumstances, and development with reuse, right? Making use of these assets. So development for reuse follows this app process called domain engineering. And this gives us the basis for development of the individual products. That's followed later on by application engineering, which is the development with reuse, where we build those or use those assets to build new concrete products. So um, as opposed to other reuse driven approaches, the product line infrastructure encompasses all the assets that are relevant throughout the development life cycle. Those assets cover the whole range from the requirements to the architecture, to implementation, to testing. Right? Um, the range of assets together, the reusable elements together define our product line infrastructure. And a key distinction of product line engineering from other reuse approaches is that the various assets themselves contain explicit variability. We plan from the start for how the final concrete products vary from each other and how we, we are going to customize the assets. So for example, the requirements might contain an explicit description of specific requirements that apply for a subset of products. And we make that clear in the requirements. When we're planning the requirements, we know ahead of time, we plan that these are going to live in a subset of products and are not going to be true for every single product that we end up building. All right. Um, the individual assets in your product line infrastructure then are linked together, just like the assets in normal software development. So you define traceability between the among the individual assets, ideally enabling one to take a requirement and identify all the other related implementation code and test cases for that requirement. 
application engineering follows, and that's the development with reuse, where you take your portfolio, your infrastructure that you built during domain engineering, and you create the final products on top of that product line infrastructure. So application engineering is strongly driven by um, the product line infrastructure, which usually contains most of the functionality already. Right. So by the time we go to build a concrete application, a lot of what we've already done in, during the domain engineering process is ready to go and ready to be deployed in a new product. So the variability explicitly modeled in your infrastructure gives you the basis for deriving individual products. Basically, when you're building a new product, you set up an accompanying project. The requirements are gathered and categorized as being either part of the product line or product specific. And then the assets, the architecture, the implementation, code assets can be instantiated right away, brought from your infrastructure, leading to an initial product version. And when you start application development, um, if you've done fairly thorough product line engineering, up to 90% of your product might already be available just by reusing the existing code in your infrastructure that you developed during domain engineering only the remaining 10% or so might need to be developed in the further step. Now, something to keep in mind here is that uh, with careful planning and with some adaptation, that asset portfolio can include not just the assets you've built yourself, not just code you've implemented yourself, but increasingly can, be made, can make use of microservices that are built to be adaptable from the start with well-defined APIs. You, know, you can go and grab just a web service with a REST API and just call that and integrate that into your product. Right, so most processes then of traditional software engineering cover the life cycle of a single software system. And uh, we specify requirements and design and, and we implement the, that design and we verify its correctness through testing and then we deploy it, right? For software product lines, we need to change how we think about software development a little bit. Uh, in contrast to analyzing and implementing a single system, well, what we have to do is we have to look at a variety of desired systems that are similar but not identical, right? What are all the different products we're going to build? And that's where domain engineering starts. A key success factor of product line development is to focus on a well-defined and well-scoped domain for the variety of systems that you're going to build. You're not going to end up supporting every single possible usage scenario and every single functionality ever, but you can plan uh, a set of related systems that differ in meaningful ways, but that do have commonalities and that can make use of those commonalities to deliver these new systems quickly. So broadly then when we talk about domain engineering, a domain is an area of knowledge that's scoped to maximize the satisfaction of the requirements of its stakeholders that encompasses a distinct set of concepts and terminology that's understood by the practitioners in that domain and that includes and defines the knowledge of how to build systems or parts of systems in that area. So that's kind of vague. So more concretely, what does that mean? Well, essentially a domain is a set of systems that have something in common. At a high level, maybe we think about databases as a domain or social networks, um, deep learning systems, network management systems, um, data classifiers, right? Some, some area where we might develop a product to meet the needs of users interested in that area. But then you can dive in further from there and define subdomains within this, right? Uh, the broader the domain, the smaller the set of similarities between products. Although there are similarities that could be exploited, you know, in deep learning systems, for example, uh, the applications of those programs are quite broad. Well, well, what are you using this deep learning system for? Well, maybe for image classification or text processing uh, or identifying the factors that lead to a particular decision being made and so on. So the individual systems in this deep learning domain may have substantial differences, which decreases your potential for reuse. So then focusing on a subdomain within that uh, might increase your reuse potential while keeping maintenance effort fairly acceptable. 
And so instead of saying, hey, we're going to develop a family of systems for all deep learning applications, what you might do is dive into this and say, all right, we're going to develop a family of products that allow image classification and that can work on different types of image data that come into them or have a different ultimate purpose for how they make use of that image data. But there, you know, that way we have a family of machine learning algorithms that take in images and do something with those images. And we can develop then a range of products based on that common out common focus of um, classifying image data. Does that make sense? I hope. Right. But um, the bottom line is that uh, proper scoping of your target domain is essential. Um, what is your family of systems going to encompass? What is the goal of this family of systems? Broadly, we start on deciding on scoping and examining the domain that we're interested in. So a development process for product lines has to take the idea of a domain of a set of related but differing systems into account. And so two issues play a key role here, um, the explicit handling of variability and the systematic reuse of implementation artifacts. Right. For both, it's important to have an appropriate structure of process and of, of artifact development. And so the specific characteristics of product lines lead to a separation between domain engineering and application engineering and between what we call the problem space and the solution space. So, you know, again, domain engineering is our process of analyzing the domain of the product line and developing the reusable artifacts. Domain engineering doesn't result in one specific product, but it prepares artifacts to be reused in multiple products. It is the idea of development for reuse. Application engineering develops a specific product. Um, and it reuses artifacts from the domain engineering process whenever possible. So development with reuse. Right. Application engineering is repeated over and over again uh, for every single concrete product of the product line that we build. We go through this application engineering process. Right. But it should be a small process. Right? It should be able to largely reuse items from the one-time domain engineering process. Um, the, the distinction then between problem space and solution space is going to be used to highlight two different perspectives. The problem space takes the perspective of the stakeholders and their problems, the requirements, and the views of our entire domain and the individual products. So features, we, you know, the features of our product line characterize the problem space. The stakeholders are interested in what externally visible functionality that they can interact with. And in contrast, the solution space represents the developer perspective here. Right. It's characterized by code structure, by architecture, by the functions and the classes and the program parameters. And the solution space covers the design, the implementation, and the, the testing of the features and their combinations in suitable ways to facilitate systematic reuse. <laughs> Right, so the distinctions between domain and product or an application engineering, as well as the problem space and the solution space, give us really four clusters of tasks that we follow in product line engineering. So the first of these is domain analysis. And domain analysis is a form, form of requirements engineering for the entire product line. Here we need to decide the scope of our domain. Broadly, what are we building for? which products should be covered by the product line. And uh, as a result, which features are relevant and should be implemented as reusable artifacts. The uh, results of domain analysis are usually documented in a feature model. Then we perform requirements analysis. Requirements analysis on the application side investigates the needs of a specific customer or client as part of application engineering. In the simplest case, the customer's requirements are mapped to a feature selection, and that's based on features identified during domain analysis. If additional requirements are discovered at this point, um, then those can be either fed back into domain analysis, which can then modify our feature model or eventually our reusable artifacts, right? Uh, or 
um, they might end up being part of just this specific product. Domain implementation on the domain engineering side is where we develop these reusable assets that correspond to the features we identified in domain analysis, right? So we go and actually build reusable assets to use in later concrete products. This includes our source code and our test cases for those individual features. And then finally, we, we perform product derivation uh, during application engineering. And that's the implementation step of application engineering, where reusable assets are combined to form a new concrete product. So domain engineering is performed once for the entire product line, whereas application engineering is performed for every individual product. A goal of product line engineering then, in general, is to move as much development as possible from application engineering repeated for every concrete product to domain engineering done once. For example, if um, quality assurance, like code inspections and testing is something that can be done in domain engineering, instead of looking at the individual products, well, then you can dramatically reduce the cost. And so you do a lot of testing on the reusable assets in isolation to make sure they're working as well as they can. And then you do a lighter amount of testing for the individual products where you focus on feature interaction rather than focusing on the individual assets. Um, a major goal of feature-oriented product line development is to fully automate product derivation, although you know, you're never really there. You always have to do some application-specific development. Some customization effort is always needed, but you can reuse a lot. Like I said, you, could, you can perform up to 90% of your concrete product development once as part of the, the domain engineering process. Right. So let's focus on the, these individual steps. Uh, domain analysis is a form of requirements engineering for the whole product line. It's concerned with the product, the problem space, and it contains two primary tasks that we focus on, domain scoping and domain modeling. Um, domain scoping is deciding on the product line's extent and range. So we decide on which of all the possible requirements arising in the domain that we're going to consider. The scope describes the desired features or specific products that should be supported. For example, if our domain is uh, embedded database systems, well, we might decide which hardware architectures we're going to support from all embedded architectures out there. Do we support ARM processors? Do we support ARM and RISC processors? And so on. So during domain scoping, the domain experts, your developers, are going to collect information about the target domain. So for example, they might go out and analyze existing systems in this area. Um, yeah, right. Um, we then are going to decide on the limits of our product line. Uh, product lines with a smaller scope are easier to develop, they're easier to maintain, right? So you wanna, you wanna constrain this as they're going to target a, a well-defined domain of very similar products with a few variations with a lot of reuse. The more we try to do, the less reuse is possible. So the broader the scope, the more features the product line has, um, the, more, uh, the more possible customers can be satisfied, which is great. So there's a trade-off there between the implementation effort and the, the maintenance effort required and the potential use cases and customer bases you can support in your product line. That trade-off requires careful consideration, uh, including looking at the um, prospective re revenue you might get, your potential customer base, the implementation cost of every additional feature and the, the projected maintenance cost, and plan for that and decide on what your limits are. So in this domain of embedded data management, a product line might need to cover uh, basic data management functionalities like targeting different operating systems for embedded devices. What features then do we need to cover? Well. Maybe we need to cover transactions, recovery, encryption, and basic queries to a database. And maybe we want support for multiple embedded operating systems like TinyOS, Linux, maybe Android, something like that. And by focusing on embedded systems as a domain, several features are outside the scope of the product line. We don't need to worry about them. For instance, um, cloud-based storage is something that you may not be viable for your embedded system. It may not have an always on internet connection and may need to store everything locally, okay? So that means there are certain features we just don't need to care about by constraining our domain to embedded systems. 
Uh, other features are not so obvious. For example, we might want to consider whether and to include uh, multi-user access, which in, brings in security needs as an optional feature. Um, it might be good to include security features and open up multi-user support, uh, but the number of customers interested in that might not be huge. And so maybe that's something that we can just omit from our portfolio. Uh, after interviewing different than different potential customers, we might decide to exclude the feature from the product line scope uh, as the, the potential revenue that would come in doesn't cover the required implementation and maintenance costs of adding this multi-user support and security support. And so we, we might just choose to leave it out of our product line. Um, now, one thing we might wanna consider are spreadsheets, for example, right? Uh, we are going to develop a new spreadsheet application and we want to perform domain analysis for this, right? Um, so for going, what we would do is we would start by looking at existing products. We take a look at, you know, Excel, look at Google spreadsheets and what kind of features do those support and what kind of new things could we do? So to think about this, um, what are some features a, a user would expect? Maybe type a few into the chat. Like what kind of features come to mind when you look at spreadsheets? Uh, things that a user can interact with and are features that might appear in multiple data, multiple spreadsheet products, but might not appear in others. Anyone want to throw something into the chat? All right. So I see cells, anything else? Calculations, programmable functions, great. Yeah, functions performed on those cells, basically. Yeah, there's a lot of great, of great things here, right? Um, macros, functionality. Yeah, so those are the kind of things you, you think about. These, are, these should be user accessible, often functionality, right? Um, how we go about performing some kind of operation. So maybe not cells themselves, right? Is that something... Um, that's not really a, a feature, but is more just an inherent storage mechanism, something like that. But the other ones we've mentioned here are definitely um, formula support, conditional formatting, like a formatting something as a number versus a date, versus a fraction, versus the number of decibel points you set. Conditional formatting might be a feature. Um, text formatting is a feature, right? One product might let you bold text or set it to different colors, and another product might not support bolding text creating charts, right? Uh, performing a summation over a selected data, uh, sorting a column. Uh, the different input and output options. Do you support um, CSV files, XML files, you know, open office, Excel format, PDF for either reading data in or exporting data? Right, those are different feature options. These are things where you could decide on a subset of these. We're going to, um, we're going to allow you to, to import Excel and CSV files, but we're not going to let you import um, open office files or something like that, right? Uh, you might have features related to how you perform data backup to perform uh, to prevent file corruption. And then there's variations in some of these. You know, which, which subset of options is each concrete product going to support? So for text formatting, for example, one product might let you bold text and another might not. One might let you italicize text, the other might not. One might let you select a column and decide whether the numbers inserted in that column should be treated as, um, as credit card numbers versus integers versus dates versus floating point numbers. All right, this idea makes sense though. The features of your product are the are user, generally user visible uh, choices that you make, right? Uh, what functionality can a user interact with? And for the functionality users can interact with, what are the possible variations in that functionality that might be supported by some, but not all of your products? Or as a second domain, we might consider management of student data, of student grade and course data, like what you'd see when you go to Ladoc, right? Uh, and what kind of features does a product line for this domain for student grade and course management need to offer? Well, when we get to this product or we get to this product domain, what we have to realize is we have actually two different stakeholder perspectives, students and teachers, right? Our product line could serve both um, using different concrete functionality. 
right? So from the student side, you know, students want to see their grades. They want to see the courses they've completed. They want to see their upcoming courses they're signed up for. They might want to apply for degrees or certificates uh, or add existing degrees and certificates and credentials. From the teacher side, we have different functionality, though there are some shared perspectives, right? From the teacher functionality, they want to see the grades for the students in their class. They want to enter grades. They want to certify that those grades are correct. Um, they want to see the courses they've taught in the past and the grades they've reported for those, right? And so there's some things that vary from user to user. You know, only teachers enter grades, whereas students just see their grades. But there's also shared elements in here. For instance, teachers and students want to see grades. Um, teachers and students want to see the results from past courses, right? And so in the back end, we could resort or we could associate course records with profiles in a fairly flexible manner and support reuse in that way for seeing grades. So domain modeling then captures and documents the commonalities and the variabilities of your scoped domain. So as a first step, we might um, give examples for possible products as well as counter examples documenting which products are and are not in the scope of our product line. Then the commonalities and differences between the desired products are going to be identified and documented in terms of their features and their mutual dependencies. Um, and this is the feature modeling that we're going to talk about next week or next class. Uh, but for example, in the domain of embedded data management, we might identify storage, transactions, the operating system, and encryption as the features we're going to support. Storage and operating system are mandatory. The others might be optional. Uh, and an example for restricting the possible products is that we cannot select more than one supported operating system at the same time. Makes sense? Any questions so far? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, take a go ahead and take a ten minute break. Uh, so we'll we'll nine minute break. Let's say we'll return at two fifteen and continue from there. If you have any questions, feel free to send those in the chat in the meantime. But yeah, let's resume at fifteen after.
All right, let's get back into it. All right, so the next step of this is requirements analysis. And requirements analysis in product line engineering is similar to requirements analysis in traditional engineering. All right, this is something that we do uh, on the application side, right, for a concrete product. We solicit the customer's requirements through interviews and through document analysis, but in product line engineering, we also build in the knowledge we've already gathered during domain analysis. There we identified possible requirements arising in this domain and we try and map the customer's requirements to those we've already identified during domain analysis. Ideally, requirements analysis can be reduced to a selection of existing features such that the product can be assembled using uh, reusable assets associated with those features. If a customer's requirements can't be mapped to one or more existing features, we can then decide if that requirements either are out of scope for our product line and we just will not provide a corresponding feature, not our job, um, and we can then assemble the next best product without this feature and manually extend the resulting product with customer extent extensions. And that way we can invest additional implementation effort during application engineering, which is not integrated back into the product line. Or we could decide to change the scope of our product line and include the additional requirements as reusable assets within that, in which case we go back to domain engineering and implement a new feature or modify an existing one. After that point, we can map the customer's requirements to those features, uh, which other customers can then benefit from as well and, and other concrete products in our product line. Which path to take is a business decision, right? Where you, that you have to weigh again, the benefits of developing this, these new requirements for reuse or developing as part of this one particular concrete product, All right? So it may be a benefit in the long term to add this requirement to our product line and represent it with reusable assets. Um, or if we don't see this being reused, it probably makes sense to leave it as part of one concrete product. Right. So in our embedded database example, we were talking about before the break, maybe we have a database product line with features for query processing and transaction support. Well, maybe during requirements analysis, we learned that the customer wants a multi-user client server environment based on SQL queries. And we can map those requirements directly to our existing features for query processing and transaction support and the respective implementations already in our product line and the reusable assets. However, we might have earlier decided the multi-user was out of scope and we're just not going to support it or we could add it solely to this one implementation, or we could revisit our earlier domain analysis and decide now we're going to add multi-user support as a feature for a whole product line. So three paths we can take that we would decide here. Ignore it, include it only in this product, or go back and add it into our product line for reuse in other products. So after you identify the features, we want to implement those in the form of reusable artifacts. So domain or feature implementation is a step we take during domain engineering to target the solution space instead of the problem space. And here we work in technical terms, code structures, architecture, concrete classes and modules, and implement solutions based on our domain requirements. So here we implement the reusable assets that are going to go into a number of products in our product line. The implementation process requires a bunch of considerations beyond just writing code, though. First, we need to select a general implementation strategy. So how are we going to implement reuse? For example, we had uh, last class, we talked a little about these um, preprocessor directives in C and C++, or we tell the compiler what to compile into the product based on the choices we've made. We could do that here and then have that as our way of implementing different feature options to include or exclude variable code conditionally. Uh, we could build um, a, a skeleton framework that can just plug in different modules on demand at runtime. So classes or microservices, we bind at runtime, right? We have different options there. Second, depending on the implementation strategy, we might need to prepare the design and code so that we can hook in different feature implementations. 
For example, we might design how to structure common parts of the implementation, how to design interfaces, and where to leave variation points and how to enable or disable variations for features. Finally, the fourth step during application engineering is to derive the final concrete product from reusable assets, adding any additional custom implementation that's necessary for that one concrete product. So depending on the choice of implementation strategy, uh, a product for a given feature selection can, can be composed using the assets we developed during domain, engineer, or domain implementation. In some cases, we can even fully automate generation of a product uh, based on feature selections and reusable artifacts, where right? we select the artifacts that are going to co correspond to the selected features and just call a composition engine to combine those into an executable without further manual intervention. In most cases though, what we're going to need to do is write some skeleton code that pulls these reusable assets together into the concrete product and does a bit of customization to make them all work together in the expected manner, right? Uh, many parts of the implementation have already been prepared during domain implementation and can be reused, but the combination of the artifacts does typically require some manual work where you still write the code that connects those artifacts, adapts them, patches up any gaps in functionality where no reusable artifacts exist. In both automatic and manual cases, the resulting product usually then has to be tested to make sure it does work as expected before being delivered to the customer. Right Now, you've often, during domain engineering, um, tested the individual assets in isolation. Here, you're focused on testing their interactions and what happens when you bring together this particular combination of features. But often, this can be done by running tests that you've already derived from artifacts during domain engineering. Right? So these two types of engineering are, in the ideal case, only loosely coupled and then synchronized by platform releases. As a consequence, they can be conducted based on two completely different life cycle models. Domain engineering focuses on the development of these reusable assets that provide the necessary range of variability. As domain engineering continues, as long as the product line exists, right, you're never quite done with that, the underlying software development approach has to be able to cope with long-term, highly complex system development and changes. As a result then, domain engineering sets up the common product line infrastructure, including all the required variability, while application engineering then comes into these smaller life cycles focused on development of the individual systems on top of the platform. Uh, a large part of development effort, a large part of your complexity is moved into the domain engineering life cycle. So as a result, application engineering and its underlying life cycle is usually going to be profoundly different uh, as it won't need to cope with as much complexity and the development won't spend as much time as domain engineering. But on the other hand, application engineering is directly involved with the customer and often needs to deal with much more rapid changes than domain engineering does. And as a consequence, a life cycle model able to cope rapidly with change is required. So a fairly agile development process. Um, within domain engineering, our main activities are first uh, product management, where we define the products that are going to constitute our product line as a whole where we aim at identifying the major commonalities, what's common across the line, and the major variabilities, what's going to be true of a subset of our products. Uh, this lets us plan our portfolio. It also encompasses major economic analysis of the products of our product line. The major output of this activity is a roadmap for our product. What is our domain concretely? What kind of systems do we plan to build? what will be true of all systems in our product line, and what are the elements that are vary, going to vary between entries of our product line. This goes into domain requirements engineering that starts with this roadmap and aims at producing a comprehensive analysis of the requirements for the products in that product line. It captures those requirements, identifies the commonalities and variabilities in detail, uh, and is used to construct a, a model of your features and what can vary in your product including specifying different variation points and the features for those points, which support further development. Third, we design for our domain, starting from the requirements model. We try to develop a reusable product line architecture, this reference architecture that provides the basis for all of our future realization within the product line. 
Fourth is domain re realization. And this is where we are going to actually program these reusable assets. We're going to go through our detailed design and implementation of reusable components. So at this stage, the planned variability, which has been expressed in our requirements and in our feature model has to be realized with adequate implementation mechanisms. And then domain testing, right? And the same as verifying these reusable components in isolation that were implemented as a result of, the, of this process. So domain, domain testing is uh, fairly difficult compared to testing within a single system context for mainly for two reasons. And first is that the implemented variability has to be taken into account. And there's no specific product already providing us in the, the, the integration, right? We focus on testing the assets in isolation here, but hope to capture problems that would emerge from their combination. Domain testing is going to give us uh, reusable test assets that we can reuse in application testing for the concrete applications later on. And we have to be careful to verify these assets again within the context of the concrete application, which is often just a matter of running our unit tests again, right? Um, but may require a bit of adaptation for your concrete product. Application the engineering then consists of similar activities for each of the individual concrete products. So first you have your application requirements engineering. And here you're going to identify the specific requirements of your individual product, right? So as opposed to requirements engineering for a normal single system, this is going to start from your commonalities and variabilities. And your goal is to stay as close as possible to your product line infrastructure. They have to do the minimum additional effort to produce a concrete product. We then move into application design where we derive an instance of the reference architecture for this product with any necessary customizations that's going to conform to the requirements that you've identified for this concrete application. On top of this, you're going to add in any of your product specific adaptations, anything that has to be true for the specific product that isn't already uh, implemented within your, your product line. Then as far as your reasonable components are concerned, the architecture has to be consistent with the reference architecture, letting you plug and play from the existing reusable assets. This goes into the application realization step. So based on your available requirements and your architecture, the final implementation of the product is going to be designed and developed. And that includes reuse, any configuration of your existing components, as well as building any new components corresponding to product specific functionality. Uh, and then finally, application testing. So testing the final concrete product and verifying that it meets your application requirements. And so again, this is going to build on your reusable assets from the domain development stage. If you have tests already from there, you rerun those tests to verify that the components work. But you might need to do a bit of um, additional, Oops. looks like we had a minor technical issue here. All right, there we go, oh, nope. Where is our slides? All right. Can you all see my slides? All right, perfect. Thank you. Um, there's a there's a bad cable here and managed to knock it loose. Okay, great. Um, so the main thing here is that we're, we're going to need to test this specific product. We can do it to some extent by looking at the testing we already did for the individual assets, but we're also going to need to test the integration of those assets together and look for any issues that emerge from this one particular realization of our architecture. Great. So what I'm going to do is um, go ahead and wrap up a little here with the main content. We have more to come after this. Um, but what we've talked about is this two life cycle approach of domain and application engineering. In domain engineering, you're developing assets to be reused later on, right? And so you have to plan a little bit. What is going to be true of all products we build? What is going to vary between them? What are the set of features? And how are those features realized, right? And you, your requirements, your design, your coding, your testing, and so on are all planned for that variability centered around these reusable assets. You then will, for each concrete application, perform a shorter application engineering process that makes heavy use of reuse, that builds a product on top of that infrastructure. 
and where up to 90% of your new product can be built from those assets, right? Um, so next time we're going to go into this for more detail and talk about feature modeling, uh, which is a way to define a constrained variability for product lines and your basis for planning your product line. Um, Team selection, if you haven't done that yet, that's due tonight. Teams of six to seven people, email me or email me if you just want to be placed on a team. In any case, if you don't respond, by the end of the night tonight, tonight when I go in tomorrow morning, I'm going to assign everyone who remains to a team at random uh, and complete forming teams in that way, right? Uh, but the, we want to get this done because assignment one is going out and um, it will be formally assigned tomorrow, but the handout is already on Canvas. So you want to see the handout, but I need the teams complete to then assign it to, the, to everyone. But once the teams are complete tomorrow morning, we'll formally assign assignment one. Assignment one is due by the end of the day on Sunday, November 15th. And the idea in this assignment is to create a case study examining the development of a software product line or some reuse driven complex system, right? There's a book uh, called Software Product Lines in Action, The Best Industrial Practices in Product Line Engineering. It's a book you have free access to. This has a bunch of case studies. So that's, a, that's one decent source. Um, but of course this book is a little older. So you may be able to find other software product lines or other complex systems built on reusable assets or that make heavy use of external libraries and create a case study based in development of those systems. So for example, a lot of companies blog fairly extensively about their products, um, Netflix, Facebook, Spotify, and so on, all do a fair amount of, of blogging about the, their engineering decisions. And so you're right, your goal here is to find a some sort of reuse-driven or product line system and talk about it some. Um, you need to ensure that sufficient information is available on your system, so do a bit of research. Your team will be assigned a supervisor completing uh, the, once you've complete the team formation. And so you'll talk to them and get approval for the system you're planning to write about. And then what you're going to try and do is document a bit of information about the system. What kind of organization is this that's adapting reuse driven or product line engineering? What kind of approach did they use? How did they go about creating a product line? How did they go about supporting reuse? What practices did they employ? What issues do they encounter when implementing product lines or reuse driven engineering? And what kind of results did they get? Uh, what kind of improvements in business architecture process or organization did they see as a result? And what conclusions did they find from implementing product lines or implementing reuse driven engineering? Uh, you can also write about other aspects of the system you feel are relevant, but the main idea is to capture how they implemented the product line or how they made use of reuse of assets or planned for reuse of assets. Um, and reflect on the choices that are made by the engineers building those systems and providing a bit of commentary and opinions on their choices. Did you feel those were reasonable decisions they made? Do you see any potential weaknesses in the decisions they made? Are there alternatives you feel they should have considered? We don't expect you to design a perfect system or, or construct you know, a 20-page paper or anything like that. There's no minimum page length. But really, we want you to um, document and reflect on the engineering decisions made to create a software product line or to create a similar type of system using information you can find out there. Um, there's a bit more information in the handout, but are there any questions on this assignment? Okay. So the next thing that we're going to do um, is give a bit of an introduction to the RoboCode framework. This is framework that's not going to be used in your first assignment, but is the basis for most, uh, or if not all, of the remaining group assignments after this point. And so we want to give a bit of an overview on this. Um, what we're going to do is take uh, another five-minute break just to get set up, and then um, uh, we're going to give a, a short presentation just to introduce RoboCode and give you an idea of what it's about, right? So in the meantime, again, if there's any questions, go ahead and send those to the chat.
Can you hear me? Please say yes in the chat if you can. Yes, perfect. So hello everyone and welcome to this uh, introduction of Robocode. Uh, please feel free to ask questions during the, uh, the presentation and uh, use the, the chat window for that. Uh, I have it open on the on another screen here so and I will take a look at it uh, every time I can. So why Robocode? As, uh, as Gregory just told you, uh, starting from assignment two, uh, most of the assignments will be based on this framework called uh, Robocode. Uh, so this is why we have this introduction here to give you an overview of Robocode. We will not go into too much details because uh, that will take uh, so much time, but you will learn about Robocode as, uh, as you get along with, this, uh, with these assignments of this course. So what is Robocode? Uh, well, it's a programming game. Um, it provides a game engine to simulate uh, competitions or battles uh, with robots. Um, and in this game, you don't, you don't control the robot directly, but you rather uh, implement the behavior you want the robot to have, and then you send it out to, to, uh, to fight other robots. Um, so you do this by implementing uh, one or more Java classes. You can do this using .NET as well, but in this course, we will focus on Java. Uh, so the competitions, they take place on a simulated battlefield, as you can see here in the screen, here. And so the purpose of, of the assignments you have on, on Robocode is not for you to create the most competitive or the best robot uh, out there, but rather to, um, yeah, to learn creating SPL software product lines. Uh, in a hopefully fun and uh, interactive environment. Right. So first of all, I have a couple of very useful and important websites that I wanted to show you. Uh, the first one is the RoboWiki. So I will go ahead and open this one. Here's the RoboWiki and uh, here you find most information you need uh, or and you will need during your um, when you, when you create the, uh, the assignments, when you work on the assignments. For example, in assignment two, where you're going to create some domain analysis, you will want to look at the bots here. We have on this website, we have more than 200 uh, open source bots. Let's take this one, for example. You can find some background information about this. Uh, uh, by the way, whenever I say bot, I mean robot. I, I just happen to say bot sometime. Um, you find some background information, the strategies that uh, that the robots use to, uh, or this particular robot to move, to fire, or to dodge bullet and so on. And so some robots are also uh, behave better in one-to-one -one battles and other in melee. Uh, you will find all information here. Um, yeah. And the second website is this one. It's a Robocode home website uh, from where you can download Robocode. Uh, and you also have this uh, documentation about the Robocode API, which is very handy. Uh, we will get to this uh, later in the demo when I show you some things uh, about how to implement or how to create your first robot. I will get to that. I'll go back to the presentation. So what is a robot? Well, as you can see here in this uh, picture here, this is a robot in Robocode. Uh, it has three main elements. It has a body, uh, a gun, and a radar, right? So the body is uh, what drives the robot. It, uh, it is used to, to, uh, to move the robot forward or backwards or turn the robot uh, right or left. Uh, the gun is mounted on the body and it can also turn right or left independent of the body. And then you have the radar, which is used to scan other robots in the battlefield which is also, so if you don't have um, separate implementation for or, or behavior, behavioral implementation for the radar and gun, they will move together, other, but you can also separate them and move each one uh, separately. And each area of these, each element of these, they, have, they contain a set of strategies. For example, for the body and the movement part, some robots will have a, maybe a strategy to randomly move in the battlefield. Other robots will, will have another other strategies, maybe by just uh, yeah, going by the walls or 
taking one corner or so on. So there are multiple strategies and for shooting as well for the gun and for scanning other robots. And you will see that uh, later. So here is how the battlefield looks like. It's a two dimensional uh, uh, battlefield area here. And here you can see different robots, as you can see, uh, battling. Uh, you can see for each robot, there is a health indicator, which um, it's out of 100. So it starts with 100 points and, and then uh, it decreases as it's, it gets shot. Um, and you see the, the name of the robots here. And you also see the bullets being fired. And when you when you hit some, or when a, when a robot gets hit, you see that by, um, yeah, there is a small explosion uh, that indicates that the robot has been hit. And when the robot dies, uh, it makes an even bigger explosion. Yes. And here you can see the uh, some uh, some information about the battle itself. So in, in RoboCode, every time measure, the time measurement is a tick. Uh, and every tick is, um, um, yeah, every robot gets a turn per tick. So every tick a robot can, for instance, turn its, um, its gun by a certain uh, amount of degrees or something. No, so, so it's the time measure uh, in RoboCode. And you also see the rounds. So here in this battle, you might configure it to be 10 rounds. Um, at the end of each round, one robot will be standing and uh, the others will be dead or killed. And then you have the uh, frame per second and the memory which is used. This is not uh, particularly important, but uh, yeah, you see it anyway here. Uh, on this uh, side here, you see all the robots that are competing in this particular uh, round uh, or battle. And you can also see two lines here, which the first one indicates uh, the health of the robot. So it, it has different colors based on, uh, or maybe the second one, yeah. Uh, the green, yellow, red represent the energy that the robot has. So it's uh, if it's over 50%, uh, then it's green. If it's between two, 20 and 50, it's yellow. And uh, if it's below 20, it gets red. Uh, and the second one, the blue one here, indicates the score you get um, in each round. But this is relative. So this one here um, means that this is how much of the total score, which is uh, scored by score uh, by corners bot here, uh, yeah, is scored by this particular one. Um, and then here you have some uh, some controls for the battlefield. You can make it quicker, uh, or if you want to debug the behavior, you can, you can make it uh, slower here. So this uh, represents how many uh, frame per seconds uh, your battle works on. And you can restart, stop, and pause the battle at any time. So when, when the battle is over, you get this score sheet, which indicates the rank of the robot. Um, so the first ranked one is this one because it got the highest total score and you get points for survival. So the more you survive, the better. And you get a bonus for that as well. And you get some points for uh, bullet damage uh, and ramming into other robots as well. And then for, yeah, and then um, for the ranking in each, in each uh, round. So this robot, for instance, ended up in the first place 89 times out of 102 which were run here so we had 102 uh, runs and uh, this one ended up in the first place 89 times second place five and third, third place twice but it doesn't mean if you so survival is only one of these right so you could end, end up in the first rank even though you're not surviving all the time So there are some constraints here. You can't, you can't always have the best robot that does everything. There are some constraints. There are some trade-offs to be done. Uh, for instance, that uh, the robot loses health points for getting hit. And it also loses health points for shooting when it shoots um, or when it hit walls. But it gains points 
back when it hits other robots. So if you scan a robot and you, you, you shoot at that robot, if you, if you actually hit it, you, you gain some, some health points back. Um, and here are some examples of these constraints I was talking about. So the gun turn max is 20 degrees. You can't turn the gun more than 20 degrees per tick per, per time measure. Um, and same thing for the radar. You can only turn it by 45 degrees. And the robot velocity influences the body uh, turn rate. So the quicker you, 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 you program your robot to be, um, the slower it will turn, right? And the bullet power and speed as well, because you have this uh, shooting cooldown time, which, uh, uh, yeah. So when you fire some, uh, some, some bullets, you have to wait for a certain time before you can fire other bullets. And the more powerful your bullet is, the, the longer time you have to wait. Um, so yeah, these are some examples. But if you want to see more details, you can always go to this website here, which is also available on, uh, on the RoboWiki, right? Yeah. Uh, you can see all the game physics here. So let me start from the beginning here. So here is RoboWiki. If you go to the main page, uh, you can see some documentation. And in that documentation, you can find some beginner guide. And in that there is the game physics, for instance, which tells you exactly what the, uh, these constraints are and uh, how to calculate them. So for instance, uh, here's the rotation and here is the exact formula of how the rotation should, uh, should be calculated and so on. And for the bullets as well and everything. All right. So for the um, coordinate system, it uses the Cartesian coordinate system with the zero, zero point being here at the bottom left corner. So zero degrees will be pointing up and 90 degrees is uh, to the right, 180 degrees, 270. So if you, for example, tell your robot or your radar to, to, to turn around 360 points, it will turn around like this and it will scan the whole battlefield, right? But it will take you many more ticks because you can only turn it 45 degrees per tick. Um, some of the angles used are absolute angles, as I just showed you, but other are relative angles. And these are shown in this example here. So um, if you call the get, he get heading uh, method on this particular robot, you will get, you'll get this angle here, right? Which is the difference between the heading and, the, uh, and this axis here. Right? And same thing for the gun heading. This is the gun, this is the angle you get. But if you scan another robot, you get an event back, right? And in that event object, you can call a method called uh, get bearing, uh, bearing. And that one will give you the relative angle between your heading and the heading or, of the gun uh, where this scanned robot is, uh, uh, is pointing. So you will get this red one here. You can read more of the uh, of this in this uh, in this uh, link here, and on RoboWiki, of course, you find all the information you need. So let's have a quick demo. I've already started RoboWiki. Can you see it? Please say yes. Yes, perfect. All right. So I will go ahead and create a new battle. Here's what you get. So you get, uh, yeah, different uh, robots here. So we get to we go to the sample ones and we select the robots we want to compete. So we have corners, crazy, and uh, Ramfire, for instance. All right, and then we can start the battle. So you can see all three robots. Um, this shade here indicates where they are actually looking. And this one, uh, I don't think it's enabled by default, but you can go to options, preferences. Okay, and then you get this, this uh, view option here and you can, yeah, you can just click on this one to show them. Um, they're important when you, when you want to debug. 
So um, now this is a little bit uh, slow because I have it on 15 uh, frames per second. So you can see here that this one here, is, which is called corner, which just died. Uh, yeah, its behavior is just to just find the first corner it finds in the battlefield and stay there and start scanning the battlefield and shooting at other robots. Uh, Ramfire, at it, as its, uh, its name suggests, it uh, scans for other robots. When it finds one, it goes to it and it just tries, tries to ram into it and uh, make it lose health. So if I make this a little bit quicker, you can see the battle here. Right. Now this is round two. We have 10 rounds. And at any point here, you can click on a robot, on a robot's name, and you get this console. Right. You can see here the properties. Um, yeah, the energy which the robot has left, the velocity, the heat, uh, body heading, and, and others. And in this console, you can also uh, you can write in, in the code, you can write uh, print out statements and they will appear here. So let's try and create a robot. So if we click on robot here, we go to the source editor. We will get this. Oh, first, maybe let's finish this one first. Yeah, uh, when all the rounds finish, you get this score sheet. Right, which tells you which uh, robot was ranked first and so on. So let's go back to this one. So we will we want to create a robot. Uh, so we take a new robot and we call it, um, I don't know, SPL uh, class or something. And then it asks for the, a package name. Yeah, SPL pack, let's call it like that. And then we get this code. So the first thing you see here is that it imports the RoboCode library. So there are a lot of things there which you do not uh, need to implement. It's already implemented. And you can extend uh, this robot class, uh, which then have all of these uh, implemented. So the, the run method here is the default, uh, is the main, uh, main method which will be run. And then here in this code, we have a while loop, which infinitely loops until, until this object is killed. And then we have the ahead. I don't know if we don't know what the ahead message uh, or the ahead method does, we can just go to robo code here and we can go to the, let's see the robot class. And here we have the ahead method which immediately moves your robot ahead forward by distance measured in pixels, right? So this means that this will make our robot go forward 100 pixels. It will turn the gun right by 360 degrees. And since the radar is mounted on the gun, it will also scan uh, the whole battlefield. So it's 360 degrees. And then it moves back by 100 and scans again. So this is the default behavior uh, for this robot. And then we have these uh, events here. So this one is on scanned robot, which means that uh, whenever you scan another robot, you get this event back, right? And then you can react. So let's take a look at the scanned robot event uh, object. Um, Yes, this one. Um, so it has a lot of uh, methods here that you can take a look at. Uh, one of them is get name, for instance, which returns the name of the robot you scan. Let's try that out quickly. Okay, so uh, on scanned robot, you can say, you can print. I scanned, and then we can have the name of the scanned robot here. Let's save, save this one. Yes, yes, please save it. And then we have to compile it. And you get this, uh, it compiled successfully. Then we can just go ahead to the battle, 
have a new battle and then what did we call this SPL pack? And we have the SPL class, which we just created. We can add it to the battlefield and then start the battle again and maybe make it a little bit shorter. So this one is our robot here. As you see, its behavior is very, very basic. It goes backwards, forward, and then when it scans a robot, it scans another robot, it shoots at it. And if we want to see the what we just uh, uh, plotted out here is the, this message I scanned, and then the, the robot is scans in, uh, yeah, in everything. So our robot just died. It's not the most sophisticated robot. All right. Um, and at the end of this, you get the, uh, the score sheet and our robot didn't do any, any good. Yeah, we didn't expect it to. Anyhow, let's get back to the presentation. I think I went through this. Uh, one thing I want to mention here is that we, the, the example I, uh, I showed you, it extends robot, but you can also extend another class called advanced robot. You can, you can read about the differences in, uh, in details in, in RoboWiki and in the documentation, but I can just tell you that it, the, the advanced robot, uh, you can, yeah, it has non-blocking calls, for instance, and it has uh, you can you can create your own uh, uh, your own events. So you can create uh, create and handle custom events uh, using this uh, advanced robot. And if you um, if you download a robot from uh, some source and you, you see the source code of it, some open source uh, robot, it will most probably extend advanced robot rather than the, rather than robot, right? I think I went through all of this. Yeah, so what's next for you guys? Uh, please go ahead and download and uh, uh, RoboCode and the required software. You, you need Java to run it. And yeah, build the first robot, uh, play around with the um, behavior and, and see how it behaves in the battlefield. And you can also run some competitions uh, to learn more. Uh, so you're creating a software product line and in that software product line, you will so your main your main product will be the robots. So uh, yeah, you should learn a little bit about them because it's important to uh, if you want to create features for for your product, it's important to know to know the product itself. Um, and here are some uh, some links for uh, where if you want to learn about targeting and movement and firing and so on. Um, there is a um, frequently asked questions. Uh, Page which you can refer to if you if you have some questions. It's on the in the RoboWiki as well. And if you are really interested into uh, what's going on in, in research in this area, so there are I have some some links here for uh, applying machine learning to RoboCodes and so on. So that's it for me. Uh, please ask questions if you have any, and we can always use the Canvas discussion section. Uh, to post any questions, um, I, I promise to 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 check that uh, every once in a while and uh, answer as uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you for listening. <laughs>